I'm Emma Pelton and I'll begin and then I'm going to pass it to my colleague Angela. But today we're here to talk about saving Western monarchs and specifically creating habitat in California. Although Angela and I couldn't help ourselves, we're going to talk about more than just creating habitat. We're hoping to speak to you all about other ways that you can help monarchs besides just create habitat. So to start off, I'm guessing that if you're here at this webinar, you probably have some familiarity with Western monarchs, but as a quick overview, Western monarchs are monarchs that grow up as caterpillars west of the Rocky Mountains. And in the spring and summer, they can be found anywhere in the Western United States, even up into Southern Canada, if milkweed grows there and there are enough butterflies. And then in the fall, those, uh, that last generation migrates to the overwintering grounds, and that stretches along the Pacific coast from the redwoods of Mendocino County in Northern California, down through the Bay Area, the central coast is really the heart of where they overwinter, into Southern California and even into Baja Mexico down near Ensenada. So most of the butterflies um, from Washington and Oregon and California show up at those overwintering grounds along the coast. But we know that there's a little bit more uh, uncertainty about where butterflies that are more in the interior west migrate to. So there you'll see multiple arrows emanating from um, Idaho that show that we think some of the butterflies are going to join those other monarchs along the Pacific coast. And some of them are probably going down through Utah and Arizona and then meeting up with eastern monarchs, which migrate to an, an overwinter in central Mexico near Michoacan. So there's some flow and these are not closed systems with Eastern and Western monarchs. But for the purposes of today, we'll really be talking about that Western population and we'll be zooming in on California. So you can see that California is really important because it both hosts these overwintering grounds for the butterflies through the winter. And then in the spring and summer and actually into the fall, there's breeding habitat throughout the state anywhere milkweed grows. So it's really an important area year round for monarchs. And why we need to help monarchs is because we've seen a massive decline in the number of butterflies making that annual migration to the Pacific coast. It's estimated that we've had about a 95% decline since the 1980s. And if you're a graph person, you can um, look at these population estimates annually over time. So each of these dots represent uh, the, the size of the population along the coast in the winter, estimated kind of in a standardized way around the Thanksgiving time period. And so regularly in the 1980s, we had millions of butterflies. You can say we were always above 1 million. We were often above 10 million butterflies estimated annually. Numbers really started to decline in the 90s. And this is when it really raised alarms among the conservation community that numbers seem to be going down. And so more systematic surveys started in the late 90s where we see a bump up actually in the population that seemed to recover briefly. And then it went back down to a new normal for the 2000s and the 2010s. We often saw 200, 300, 400,000 butterflies annually. And that became kind of where we thought the population was. And we knew it was you know, very far below what it had been a few decades ago, but seemed relatively stable. But that really changed in 2018 when the population dropped below 30,000 butterflies in a single year and was, was below 30,000 butterflies for the last three years. So that was a, over a 99.9% .9 decline, kind of dizzying numbers. But this past season, thankfully, the population bounced back up modestly, and we had about a quarter million butterflies. And so we saw more similar size to those, those numbers we would regularly see in the 2000s and the 2010s. So what the future holds is unknown. You can see that these population numbers move around a lot. That's very typical of insect populations. They're affected by weather, and they're affected by stochastic events. So some bounciness is really normal, but we still have this overall trend that we're really far below where we would like to be and where we were just a few decades ago. So why did we get here? There are like many wildlife species that are in trouble. There's usually not one cause. There's usually quite a few factors at play. And so the big factors we think for Western monarchs are loss and degradation of their overwintering habitat along the coast, loss and degradation of their breeding and migratory habitat throughout the West, and then the ubiquitous use of pesticides in our environment. And pesticides is an umbrella term that includes herbicides, which target plants, and insecticides, which target insects. And so there's a lot of transfer of these chemicals in the landscape that kind of impact monarchs and have been shown to be associated with their decline, 
with the decline of many other butterflies and bees. We also think that climate change is making this harder. We do not think that climate change is the primary reason we've had this huge decline, which I think is good news because it means that some of the things that we can really go out and do tomorrow to change the amount of habitat, the quality of habitat and our pesticide use are things that we can tackle while we all continue to tackle and mitigate for climate change. Other factors could also play a role, but we think are less um, important relative to these other factors. And so that can include um, the prevalence of a parasite called OE, which is really common in gardens and on tropical milkweed, which is non-native. And we think this pesticide or this uh, parasite can really increase um, the disease of local populations and prevent migration. Also the introduction of non-native predators. So this includes fire ants, this includes the release of non-native mantids and other insect predators might be playing a role at least locally in changing how the population is doing. And it's not just monarchs that are declining. In California alone, there are 15 butterfly species that are listed under the Endangered Species Act. And there are two candidate species, including monarchs, which have been determined as a warranting protection under the Endangered Species Act at a federal level and are expected to be listed in 2024. There's also a listed moth. And there's been a really amazing monitoring project by Art Shapiro, who's a professor at UC Davis, who has single-handedly for almost 50 years been monitoring butterflies across the Central Valley and into the Sierra Nevada. And so work based on his monitoring that his students have done have really shown that there's been a really steep decline in a lot of butterfly species and monarchs are not necessarily the most imperiled or have seen the steepest declines. So really broadly, there's, it's been estimated that we're losing 1.6% of our Western butterflies per year and that that's um, been something that's occurred over the last 40 years. So that's compounding and we've really lost a significant number of butterflies. Those declines are associated with those habitat factors, the pesticide factors, and also with warmer falls. So we're seeing how climate change is really impacting and pushing some of our species um, downward trajectory even faster as, as the planet warms. So that's the bad news. The good news and the rest of today's presentation is really what we can do about it and how you all can become part of the solution. And my guess is many of you already are. And so hopefully there's another another item or two that you'll take away from today about how you can help. There are a lot of different ways, depending on what you're interested in, restoring and protecting overwintering sites, restoring and protecting that breeding and migratory part of the migratory cycle, reducing the risks from pesticides, contributing to community science, and being an, an advocate for Western monarchs. And so collectively, these are all areas of work that Xerces works on. So we'll be highlighting some of our successes in, in these areas and how you can be part of that. So this is also an outline for our talk. I'm gonna jump right into how you can contribute to overwintering site protection. <clears throat> and so when they're overwintering, they really need these forests to grow along the coast and they need nectar. They don't need milkweed. But when they're breeding and migratory, they do need a plant called milkweed, which is generally in the uh, genus Asclepius. This is the only food that the caterpillars can eat. When that flower blooms, that also provides nectar for the adults, but the, ne but the nectar that adults use also include a wide range of other flowers besides milkweed. So my colleague Angela will talk a little bit more about that part of the migratory journey. But in terms of the overwintering sites, I have this background photo to show you. Um, this isn't a specific overwintering site, but it's a really nice example of the landscapes that they're using along um, this, this really narrow zone between the ocean and usually the coast range. They're usually quite close to the ocean, an average about a mile inland. Sometimes they're closer, sometimes they're a bit further, but they're kind of looking for this Goldilocks zone is, is what we think, what the science tells us, where the environmental conditions are just right, not use too much energy and have it be too warm, and also that it's not so cold that they're freezing. So they're using these forested groves and they stretch um, you know, really a, a wide range of the coast with the most sites concentrated in the central coast. You'll see on this map, there are little green dots kind of showing each of the locations. We know of over 500 places where monarchs have ever been found overwintering, with the vast majority right along the Pacific coast, with an exception of the East Bay and near San Francisco. And then you'll also see a few rogue dots um, in the San Joaquin Valley, which haven't been used in many, many years. And then further near Death Valley and the Saline Valley, um, we actually have 
good records and some really amazing volunteers who trek in on BLM land. Um, and those monarchs have been recorded since the 1970s, usually really small numbers, and they're typically not found throughout the winter, but there do seem to be some adaptable monarchs that, that try a different strategy some winters. So restoring this habitat is really important. A lot of it's degraded. A lot of it is in non-native eucalyptus trees. And so we really have been working closely with managers, including a large partnership with California State Parks who own a lot of the larger groves. The photo on the left shows members of the CCC and the local RCD down at Pismo Beach, which is um, an amazing site that often hosts the most monarchs of all of our overwintering sites. That state park has done a fantastic job of really planning and planting a lot of trees and nectar and increasing um, <clears throat> the viability of that really small grove that they have that hosts a lot of butterflies so that the forest will be healthy into the future. On the right, we've got a picture down on uh, Plaskett Creek Campground, which is on the Los Padres National Forest, where we worked with the Forest Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service. And this is actually a fire crew who didn't have a fire that day, so came out to help install irrigation and uh, plant trees in an area where trees have been removed. And we'd really seen fewer butterflies showing up at the site, we think, because of a lack of wind protection. So these are just two examples of kind of the work on the ground that needs to happen to actively manage these groves and make sure that they're continuing to provide habitat for the butterflies. Besides that on the ground work, we also need people just paying attention. A lot of these groves are not well recognized um, as important habitat, I think compounded by the fact that these are in non-native eucalyptus often. And so even on areas where we think there is protection and maybe the landowner is aware that they have butterflies and that their trees are really important, there can be a lot of other people that might have the right to go in and cut trees for real or perceived safety or wildfire reasons. So here's an example, a photo taken by Laura Drizd of the US Fish and Wildlife Service of a site in Ventura County where a road crew was coming in and cutting trees, even if we knew that the county knew that those were important trees. So there's just kind of communication issues. The fact that the, the butterfly is not listed, this doesn't often pop up on people's radars. And so a lot of tree work and removal happens and sites are, have been destroyed. Uh, we continue to lose sites. We're actually currently working with folks to make sure that the largest overwintering site this winter, which single-handedly hosted over 20,000 butterflies, was threatened to be developed. And so these are really examples of how precarious a lot of these site protections are. And so really trying to raise awareness. And with over 500 sites, and we have maybe five staff in California, we can't be everywhere. So we need eyes on the ground, and we very much um, benefit from volunteers and people reaching out to us when they get concerned that a site is threatened. So speaking up, joining local meetings, um, you know, reaching out if you live near a site to make sure that the people that manage that land or own that land know that they have butterflies and that those trees are important and that people would like to help them provide technical assistance and restore the site it can be really, really valuable. Um, getting policy changes because it'll be, also be effective. We've seen this in Ventura County, a real success story where someone with the county really um, increased the visibility of the overwintering sites by adding them to their local coastal plan as areas that needed to have particular uh, protections when there was a development near the coast, near these groves. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Angela. Thanks. So. Uh, the next thing you can do to help is to pr protect and restore breeding and migratory habitat in California outside of the overwintering sites. Oh, next slide. I'm like pushing the button. <laughs> so what does high quality monarch habitat look like? Well, Emma sort of got into this already, but um, good uh, migratory habitat includes native milkweeds. Again, this is the required um, food plant for the caterpillars. The adults will also eat uh, nectar from the plants. We recommend planting native milkweeds uh, because uh, parasites can build up on the tropical milkweed because it doesn't die back in the winter. So that disease just builds up. Uh, we need nectar plants. So adult monarchs will drink nectar from a variety of species. And so having a diverse assemblage of plants is good for monarchs and other butterflies and other pollinators. We think it's especially important to have plants that bloom in early spring and late fall to support uh, the migration. 
And then they need habitat that's safe, protected from pesticides, protected from high levels of pathogens, like they could get um, tropical milkweed and other features such as uh, shade or features for perching. Next. And there are a lot of places that we can create monarch habitat in our, in our cities and towns. So yes, we wanna restore habitat and protect habitat in natural areas, but we can also do it in our communities. And I think that once we start looking beyond our yards, we'll see that there are many, many places where we live where we can create habitat for monarchs and other pollinators. This photo is a monarch garden outside an office building in Oregon. And so there's just many opportunities, public gardens, parks, uh, gardens at schools or libraries or office buildings, places of worship, rights of way, so along roadsides or under power lines, these are all places where we could create monarch habitat around our cities and towns. Next. So we want to uh, plant milkweed, native milkweed. Narrowleaf milkweed and showy milkweed are the most um, commercially available species native to California that you can get. You can also sometimes find woolly pod milkweed. We have been trying to expand availability of some early emerging species like California milkweed, but also heartleaf milkweed is another one that emerges early. So might be good for monarchs, uh, that first generation breeding in the spring. Heartleaf milkweed really likes rocky soil. So if you're in part of the state with rocky soils and in the foothills, um, that might be a species to try and plant. We want to avoid planting milkweed at overwintering sites. Monarchs don't need it at the overwintering sites. They need it in their breeding habitat. And it's good to try to plant multiple species of milkweed if you can, especially in natural areas, um, just because the species have different phenologies. So they emerge and flower at different times. So if you have multiple species, you can have a longer window of, of time when you can support monarchs on those milkweed. We recommend planting in the fall, is generally when we have the most success planting transplants or seeds of milkweed. People who plant seed usually report that it takes about two years for it to come up, so something to keep in mind. If you're planting in the spring, you'll probably have better luck with transplants than, than seed. And again, we recommend avoiding tropical milkweed. It's widely available at nurseries. But again, it can lead to problems such as the buildup of OE parasit parasites. Uh, nectar plants are important. And so planting milkweed is good, but it's not sufficient. We also want to provide plenty of nectar for adult monarchs. Um, so use a variety of plants. You'll also be benefiting other pollinators and other butterflies. Uh, this plant in the picture is coyote mint. It's one of my favorite pollinator plants. Try to have something blooming from spring through fall. Though, as I said earlier, um, early spring and late fall are especially important times to have nectar for a monarch so that you can support their migration. And we have plant lists for monarchs and other pollinators available on our website. Next. Another feature that can be useful is having shade for perching. So in hot climates like we get in much of California, Trees and shrubs can be especially important for providing some shade for monarchs and a place for the perching. There's also some evidence that they like to lay eggs on shaded milkweed. I think another advantage can be extending the, the life of uh, milkweed each year. So you can see in this picture, you can see in the foreground, the milkweed is also nest. It's out in full sun all the time. But in the background, there's a bunch of milkweed growing in the shade of this oak tree, and it's still pretty green. And so I think, you know, showy milkweed and narrow leaf milkweed are kind of shade tolerant. So if you can plant some in the sun, some in the shade, you might be able to extend the period of time each year when you have green milkweed available for monarchs. Next. Xerces also does a work, a lot of work in agricultural lands. The pollinator team staff work with amazing farmers and ranchers every day who want to create habitat on their farms, on their land, to provide habitat for, for monarchs and other pollinators. Um, and they do habitat like this hedgerow here. We've got a guide, a quick guide for creating um, 
monarch habitat on, on farms that um, see Rachel just put up the link. So this is a great way to provide habitat for monarchs and other pollinators. These hedgerows create this nice linear habitat. And next, another part of our work in agriculture was to develop the certification focused on pollinators called Be Better Certified. So the idea was to create a set of standards that could show you know, which producers are actively working to protect pollinators so that consumers could reward those, um, those producers. So I think one way, if you're able to, one way to support monarchs and other pollinators is just to support farms and ranches that provide habitat for wildlife because that will benefit monarchs and other, other invertebrates. Next. In other ways, Xerces is working with Californians to protect monarchs is through our Xerces Habitat Kit program. So this started um, about three years ago when the monarch population crashed to less than 30,000 individuals along the coast. And we were trying to think about how can we get more habitat in the ground because all of our California staff were already doing as much as we could. And we realized we just need to partner with all of the like, passionate, amazing, knowledgeable people out there who are already trying to do this work. But a lot of times people are impeded by the costs of native plants because they are tend to be more expensive or maybe they just don't know what to plant. So that was how our habitat program was born. So basically we give plants away to people who are creating habitat. Um, this picture, these are students, horticulture students at Delta College. Um, and it's been a, a great success. So we're just about to start year four. Uh, we have programs now in Santa Fe, New Mexico and the Northeastern US. And we've given away over 150,000 plants to almost 450 partners over the last four years. And we're continuing. So it's been really great. Next. This is a picture of where our kits have gone to in California. So the light blue region is our priority one area for monarch restoration. This is the part of the state where most monarchs will breed during that first generation in the spring. So we think that restoration in these regions are especially impactful, though it's still worth doing restoration in zone two if that's where you are. We have three types of kits. We have a wildflower grassland kit, hedgerow kits that have shrubs like that um, picture I showed earlier, and garden kits, which are more appropriate for like a school uh, pollinator garden. Uh, they're regionally specific, so we pick the species depending on where in the state the kit will go. <clears throat> and these kits are intended for working lands or public lands, so public spaces, natural areas, um, but not home gardens, right? These are not intended for people just landscaping their own yards. Uh, applications will be available March 1st through April 15th of this year. If you're interested, you can find the interest form that you need to fill out on our website. It has information on, um, you know, site prep maintenance, you need a, a plan. We are doing a webinar, an informational webinar in a couple of weeks about that if you're interested in learning more. Next. And these are some of our wonderful kit partners. So the applications are open in the spring. You pick up your plants in October, November, when it's uh, right in time for fall planting. And um, it's really great. I love working on this project. These are some of our wonderful partners. It's really fun to meet um, everybody. Next. Some of the work that we're doing uh, in California involves expanding the commercial availability of important monarch plants. That includes California milkweed. So we've been collecting seed, we've been doing planting and establishment trials with nurseries to try and get this species um, commercially available so that more people interested in planting gardens and habitat for monarchs can use this, this species. Again, species like this and partly milkweed that emerge early we think are, are beneficial for monarchs for that first generation um, in the spring. We've also been doing some establishment trials with milkweed rhizomes. So the root stalks of showy milkweed, um, we found that 
it's really easy to get, or much easier to get milkweed to establish from those rhizomes than from transplants or seeds. So we've been doing some um, trials with partners in rangeland to see if we can find the best way to get these plants established in areas where we have limited irrigation. We also have put together a fact sheet on establishing milkweed in the West because Californian milkweeds can be a little bit uh, finicky to try and get established. Um, so we have that available to assist. Next. We also do work in rights of way, um, under power lines or on roadsides. Do a lot of work with Department of Transportation staff around the country to create pollinator habitat along roadsides. In some landscapes, roadside habitat is sort of the dominant natural area in, in the landscape. So this can be really valuable habitat for, for pollinators. And then we create these management um, recommendations. So you can find a copy of this on our website if you're interested, but we look at the timing of when monarchs will be in a, you know, in different regions, and we can recommend when would be the best time to mow or do other management that might be risky for monarchs. So for example, in, in the Central Valley, if you need to mow or, or do development or something that might be disruptive to the monarchs, the best time to do that would be between November and mid-March when the monarchs are less likely to be there. Next. The next thing we can do to help is to protect monarchs and their habitat from pesticides. Next. So we conducted a study a few years ago in 2019 to look at the levels of pesticides in milkweed. So we wanted to know if caterpillars we're encountering pesticides in milkweed throughout the Central Valley. So we went to different, um, a lot of different sites. We went to agricultural sites, urban sites, natural areas, and collected leaves from 227 different milkweed plants. Next. And what we found, we sent the leaves out to a lab to look for pesticide residues, and we found that every single sample had pesticides. So every one of those 227 plants had pesticides on them with an average of nine different pesticides per plant. Overall, we found 64 different pesticides and the plants with the highest numbers of pesticides, about 25 each, were the plants we purchased from retail nurseries and one roadside agricultural site. So the, <laughs> so, you know, that included, that included a plant that was advertised as being free of neonicotinoids, it actually did have neonicotinoids. So I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, so this study was really alarming for us. It sort of showed how ubiquitous pesticide issue is, right? I think a lot of people, when they think about pesticides, they think about agriculture. But actually pesticide use in cities and towns can be just as high or higher than it is in agricultural areas. One of the um, milkweed plants we sampled was in my coworker's backyard. <laughs> so this is a Xerces employee who has lived in her home for 10 years, never sprays pesticides, and she had 11 different pesticides on her plant, and she was very upset. <laughs> but it, it highlights this problem of drift, right? The pesticides on the plants in, this, in whatever garden you're thinking about isn't just what you're spraying, it's what your neighbor's spraying, what the person across the street is spraying, what the city's spraying, what the county's spraying, all those pesticides move around. And so we need to think about that um, and reduce that pesticide risk if we want to protect monarchs and other pollinators. Another issue to think about is neonicotinoids. So these are a class of systemic insecticides. They're very long lived and they're also very toxic to bees. Um, next. So when I say they're systemic, what that means is that the pesticide gets taken up into the plant and expressed in all the tissues. So maybe the plant is sprayed before it flowers, but when it flowers, the pollen and nectar are also going to have that pesticide. It's very long lived. It can last in the environment for months or longer, and it also gets in the soil. So if you purchase a plant that's been treated with neonicotinoids and plant it in your pollinator garden, those neonics get in the soil and get taken up by surrounding plants. So now you have many plants in the area that are contaminated with these pesticides that can be lethal for, 
for monarchs and other pollinators. So it's a problem that we need to tackle if we want to protect pollinators. Next. So I mentioned that the samples that had lots of different pesticides were the ones we purchased from nurseries. One thing we can all do is try to purchase bee safe plants from nurseries. Uh, we have a fact sheet on that. See, Rachel just put up the link. Some steps for, for buying bee safe plants include seeking out organic plants and seeds, seeking out nurseries that grow their plants in a way that um, is safe for pollinators, trying to avoid plants grown with neonicotinoids and other similar systemic insecticides, and ask your nursery what, what steps they're taking to offer pollinator friendly plants. And I think, you know, a lot of times you might ask and they might not know what the plant has been treated with, but I think there's a lot of value in asking them next. So if we just go to our nurseries and tell them, I want milkweed and nectar plants that are free of pesticides that could be harmful to monarchs and other pollinators, there's a lot of value in that because the more they hear that from their customers, the more they'll respond to that demand. So I think that's really valuable. And I also think the other piece of this is then being willing to purchase plants that are maybe not pristine, that maybe have some leaf damage, because if you're asking people not to use insecticides that are really harmful to pollinators, that means there may be some <laughs> animals used chewing on these plants. And so purchasing them anyway is another part of that. Okay, next. Oh, and now it's back to Emma. All right, thanks, Angela. So now I'm gonna talk about how you can participate in community science. And I'm really passionate about this aspect of how people can help because you don't have to have access to land. You don't have to convince other people to plant plants. It's something that anyone can go out and do um, if they have access to a phone that has a camera feature or they have a camera and access to the internet. So a few projects, there are many, many community science projects that focus on monarchs. I can't do them all justice. So I'm just gonna focus on two that Xerces is really involved with. One of them is the Western Monarch Count. This is a volunteer powered community science program. We have over 400 people that participate on some level. And then any one year we have over a hundred folks go out and in a standardized way, estimate the number of butterflies at those overwintering sites along the coast. So that's really how we made that, uh, that graph at the beginning that showed the population decline. We really wouldn't know the size of the population if it weren't for our amazing volunteers who go out and spend many, many hours, often early in the morning in the cold with their arms getting sore, um, looking up in the sky with their binoculars to count butterflies. So the heart of that project is our annual Thanksgiving count, which has been running for 25 years, and our New Year's count, which we're on our sixth year of. It's coordinated by um, folks at the Xerces Society and one of the count's co-founders, Mia Monroe. And then we really rely on a lot of volunteers up and down the coast, usually by county, who rally volunteers. And this photo is one of our great regional coordinators, Jessica Griffiths, taking folks out in Pacific Grove and looking for butterflies and teaching folks how to count. So if you wanna learn more, we're wrapping up the overwintering season um, right now in February, but you can check out uh, more information and look at an interactive map of the sites, see past year's counts at westernmonarchcount.org. Our other big project, which is focused on the rest of the year and not just California, but the whole West, is the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper, which Cersei's built with a lot of great partners and we now maintain. It's an interactive map. It's publicly accessible data of milkweed and monarch sightings anywhere in the Western US. Um, that website is monarchmilkweedmapper.org. And this is a pretty low bar participation. You don't need to get out early in the morning. You don't need to have a lot of training. You just need to take a picture of a monarch or a milkweed and then upload it and provide some basic information like where you found it. There's also an option to kind of obscure the location. So if you're noting that you found milkweed at, you know, at a private property and you don't want that to be public knowledge, you can put in like a cross street or something similar. So there's ways for people to kind of share to their comfort level. And then that really allows us to track where the monarchs are moving over time, where milkweed is emerging, where breeding is happening, and maybe more importantly, where it's not. So another feature we've added, we actually have a project in iNaturalist. Um, so we know that a lot of folks are, are using that. I love INAT. 
And I think if you just tag our, our project, then we make sure that we get it. So that's a great way to participate if you're already familiar with that app. And then also um, during this period between Valentine's Day and Earth Day, so February, March, and April, there's a special project um, related to this Western Monarch Milkweed project where Washington State University will um, enter you to win a prize every time that you note a monarch or a milkweed. So it's a great time to go out and look and pay attention. And that's called the Western Monarch Mystery Challenge. And all that data ends up in our project, but they, they just do the extra legwork and make it fun with prizes. And um, they kind of lower the bar of entry because people can just email them a photo. They don't have to, to use an app, but you can also use the INAD app or just log into our website. And then this is our, our sneaky way of getting folks that might be interested in monarchs um, who might also want to think about some other animals. There's a great community science project run by Xerces and a lot of other partners called Bumblebee Watch. And it's very similar to Monarch Watch where you take a photo of a bee, in this case bumblebees, and you upload the photo and they walk you through an ID tool and then experts verify what you found. And there's a special program that's just getting going right now in California that's really gonna take this to the next level by training people to do systematic bumblebee surveys across the state of California called the California Bumblebee Atlas. Xerces partners with the, the state of California and others to really launch this. There's trainings, um, there's gonna be field days. I think it's gonna be a really fun way to get out and learn from native bees. CaliforniaBumblebeeAtlas.org. And finally, advocacy. I've spoken a little bit early on about how monarchs are um, hopefully going to be listed under the Endangered Species Act, but they are just candidates right now. And so there's a lot of ways that we need to think about how to protect these animals and advocating for both monarchs and many other insects that need our help. Just to give you one example of a way you can be part of that process is supporting the Monarch Act of 2021. This was introduced last year by Senator Jeff Merkley, who's up here in Oregon and also representatives um, Panetta and others in California. And this Monarch Act, if it would pass, would create a rescue fund, which would provide really significant funding to work on Western monarch issues and hopefully other, other butterflies that need help. So it would do things like restore native milkweed and nectar plants, restore overwintering habitat and help protect key features from destruction. It would really take this vision called the Western Monarch Butterfly Conservation Plan, which multiple states in the West created a 50-year vision of how to bring back Western monarch numbers and really provide the funding to make that happen. So it would be providing a lot of money to states to do really good work and improve habitat on the ground. So with that, we just wanted to say, I think we were a broken record that our website had a lot of info. It's pretty much all free besides our books. So you can go in, you can look at a lot of things related to monarchs. Um, you just search Xerces, Western Monarchs, things should pop up, including those plant lists, information or buying bee safe plants, um, how to establish milkweed, and a lot more that we can't talk about today. But check it out. We also have a publications library with probably hundreds of resources, including some in Spanish, if you want to learn more. And with that, we'll just make a plug that donors make it possible. We are a donor supported nonprofit, and you can become a member today. It's another way to help by donating to Xerces or to other conservation nonprofits working on these issues. And I think with that, I will pass it back to you, Rachel. Thank you both. We have a lot of really good questions, so we'll get started here. <clears throat> um, we have one question to clarify at the very beginning of the presentation. Emma, you had said there are 15 listed butterflies in California. Is that under the California Endangered Species Act or the Endangered Species Act? <gasps> That's a great question. Yes, that's the Federal Endangered Species Act. Um, the state has their own Endangered Species Act and whether or not they can use that Endangered Species Act to get protection for insects at the state level is currently tied up in the courts. So there's currently not clarification of whether or not the state of California can list insects. We're hoping they can, and we were part of a petition to get four bumblebee species listed, but the, the legal basis for the state to be able to do that is currently in the courts. Okay, thank you. This person has a question about monarchs using eucalyptus trees. Um, if they use them and if they do, then why take them out and don't they also provide nectar? Yeah, nectar is a really um, valuable role that eucalyptus can play as well. They're kind of these 
amazing trees um, where they both provide this buffet of nectar and they provide the right overwintering conditions. So these trees are really the majority of the overwintering sites have eucalyptus. Um, they're also native trees that they use primarily um, Monterey pine and Monterey cypress, but they also can use redwoods, coast live oak. We actually have about two dozen species that we know that they can use, but most of the sites that they use are eucalyptus. And there's been great research showing that we don't think the monarchs are preferentially selecting eucalyptus. It's just the dominant tree in most areas of the coast that have the right kind of microclimate. And it's a tree that, um, you know, has really been widely planted for over 150 years. So it's a tree that they've adapted to use that they don't have to just use eucalyptus, but in a drying climate, uh, we've seen a lot of these trees really suffer. And, and I think there's a great example at Elwood, Maine and the city of Goleta, which really prides itself on its monarchs. Their grove has really suffered in recent years of drought. And so that habitat's not in great shape. And those eucalyptus forests um, are often really difficult to restore because it's hard for native plants often to take a foothold. So we're often dealing with kind of an imperfect situation of non-native forests. And so we are trying to communicate with people and convince folks that they need to keep some of these trees on the landscape and start to integrate more native plants. But there's a balance and there has to be some acceptance of leaving and protecting these eucalyptus trees, which often are not very popular because they tend to have um, higher risk of fire in some situations. and then a lot of them are suffering from the drought. So it's kind of a complicated situation and it's um, sometimes hard to communicate with folks the importance of, of saving some non-native trees. So letting them know that they have monarchs I think is a really effective way to get people to see the value of certain stands of eucalyptus. Thank you, Emma. So this other question is also about um, related to plants, but also disease. Do you know of research that is looking at whether diseases are being passed on to monarchs by other pollinators, such as honeybees and bumblebees on the plants that they share for foraging? Do you wanna take that, Emma? I'm not aware of any studies showing transmission from bees there are studies showing transmission of disease from managed bees to wild bees, but I'm not aware of, of disease transferred from managed bees to, to monarchs or other butterflies. I thought that was an interesting question. I was like, oh, I don't know. So now it makes <laughs> sense of why I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> um, this other question is also about planting flowers. I've heard that it is best to have groups of same species flowers versus one here, one there. Is that your take on best practices? Yeah, pollinators seem to like plants, flowers planted in masses. So having a grouping of a particular species of flowering plant together seems to be more attractive to pollinators than, than spread out. We have a couple questions specifically about folks who are in Nevada. Um, are there any programs or partnerships that Xerces has there? And are the California plant habitat plant kits only for folks in California? So the California kits right now are only for California, unfortunately. Um, we do have a staff number now in Nevada. Um, We some, I mean, we do occasionally, we do work in many states in the West. Um, and I don't know, Emma, if you can speak to like some of the WAFWA work in Nevada. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, there is, there is like a Nevada Monarch Working Group um, run by um, Ali Chani and others with the Department um, of Natural Heritage, Natural Heritage Inventory. And so if anybody's interested, I think that that's really, she's been someone who's been trying to communicate with folks that are interested in monarchs in Nevada and sends out emails and resources. In the past, we have done some workshops. We did some tagging and some workshops in the past. And we've done a lot of surveys. We don't have any active projects in the state that are specifically monarch focused right now, but there are people out there doing surveys. And I do think the state um, has, yeah, kind of created a network of people communicating 
Um, so I think there, there are things happening and I definitely were really grateful for some of the research out of the University of Nevada, Reno, where Matt Forrester's lab really partnered with us on that milkweed um, pesticide study work and, and some other work. So there's definitely people that are thinking really broadly about butterflies and specifically about monarchs in the state. And if anyone has questions, they can follow up by email. I'm happy to connect you with either Allie's listserv or any other resources like that. There's some folks on here from Oregon and Washington as well, and they're kind of wondering what can they do for monarchs. So I think that for Oregon and Washington, it would be this similar to what I talked about in breeding habitat. So planting nectar plants, planting milkweed, protecting that habitat from pesticides, trying to reduce pesticide use, um, engaging in community science and advocacy. I think all of those things are valuable. And the nice thing I think about doing this work for monarchs is it's gonna benefit many species of, of animals, not just monarchs. So many pollinators will benefit from these actions. Right. Okay, a little bit of a change in topic. Um, and I know this can be a little contentious. So I think this is a good um, opportunity to kind of clear it up. We get a lot of questions about raising monarchs. So this person has a friend who raises slash stewards monarchs from egg to adult. She's had great success, nearly 100% surviving to release and nine the last year with 100% success. So they have two questions. Why is this not encouraged? And they read somewhere that steward monarchs are not are at a disadvantage when it comes to geo orientation. Is this true? And if our goal is to increase monarch health and numbers, how is that affecting? Yeah, their health and numbers. I'm happy to take this one. This is this is a super interesting area that I think um, the science isn't totally there yet for some of those questions. So, you know, we kind of are rooted from the precautionary principle, which is that generally raising animals, you know, in non-standardized ways, so like in a home environment, um, in congregate is not great. I mean, that's, you know, typically not something we would do with any other animals. And I think like baby birds are a great example where, you know, most people now know that that's taking them, taking them and making them captive has downsides. And so I think the fact that insects are so mobile and they're not vertebrates, people are a little bit more prone to think about home rearing as a solution. And so I do think I've raised monarchs as a kid and a little bit as an adult, but I think it's best to, to think about that as an educational experience and something that should be done kind of for personal enjoyment and learning in really small numbers and done really sanitary in really sanitary conditions. So raising a couple that you collect and release locally, I think is a really great um, experience for people. But when we see people trying to use it as a conservation tool to increase the numbers, that's where I really don't think we have reason to think that that is going to be helpful. There really aren't you know, um, analogies to that in other animal groups. We don't rear and release um, birds in that way. And so if, if numbers get really, really low, you know, captive rearing programs run by institutions like the San Diego Zoo, or really a, a, a focused effort to do it in, in the way that addresses the, the needs and addresses the habitat so that when they're released, they're gonna be successful, they're gonna be disease-free, they're gonna be genetically diverse. You know, those are really well-designed programs. And so doing it out of your home I think you run a lot of risks and one of them is disease. And most of the data we've seen that people have really high rates of disease when they're home rearing, especially if they're rearing a lot. And also um, we're also seeing people, you know, really probably amplifying certain genetics. They're amplifying whichever insects they got and then they get really high rates of success because they've taken out predation. They've taken out a lot of stressors of the environment. And we think naturally you know, less than 5% of monarch eggs that are laid make it to adulthood. And that's some really strong natural selective pressure. And so when you kind of meddle with that, especially for a small population, we're, we're concerned that there could be some downsides to that. There have been some interesting studies that have shown lower rates of migration and less natural orientation, particularly if you're rearing them inside. So I think if you are gonna rear, you wanna do fewer numbers, you wanna make it really sanitary, you wanna do things locally, moving monarchs around, buying butterflies from butterfly farms has really, really been shown to be problematic because those monarchs um, adapt really quickly in captivity and aren't necessarily genetically the same. 
and then you want to expose them to natural light. So I think there is a place for rearing. It definitely has a long history in the community science realm of monarchs. And so I think we like to tell people like it's okay to raise a few butterflies if you really enjoy it, but you know, keep it small, keep it sanitary and don't use it as a way to boost the population because we really aren't sure that it's going to help and it might hurt. That's my very long-winded answer, but I do think it's a complicated program pro problem and it's something that a lot of people are passionate about. And I guess one more just note for the state of California, the state um, has banned handling of monarchs without a permit because of how low the numbers are and they're on um, some of their lists as the species of greatest conservation needs. So it's technically against the law to be captive capturing monarchs um, without a permit in the state. So obviously a lot of people are still doing it, but I think it's worth saying that it's not something that um, is, is legally allowed in the state. So I think particularly for California being, being thoughtful about, you know, trying to follow both the spirit of that um, and, and, and then, you know, not encouraging more people to do it, I think is really important. Thank you, Mama. Can you address the problem of monarchs leaving over wintering sites earlier, but native milkweed not being available or emerging so early in the spring? Angela, do you do you want to take that one? I just talked a long time. <laughs> sure. So this is um, a potential problem, and I think one of the issues that might be exacerbated by climate change, which is why it's important that we address climate change as it gets warmer, potentially monarchs could be leaving the overwintering sites earlier. Um, there is a bit of a black box between what they're doing in this period, between when they leave the overwintering site and the, when the breeding period begins, which is what this monarch mystery challenge is aimed at, kind of learning more about where they are and what they're doing. This is why also why we're trying to focus on um, California milkweed to get those early emerging species more readily available for people to use in restoration. Um, I mean, I think that's the what we know at this point is, and one reason why we're trying to encourage people to plant those early spring nectar plants to support the monarchs in between when um, the milkweed is emerging and when they're leaving the overwintering sites. I think there's still a lot that's unknown, but hopefully if we get more engagement and with the milkweed mapper and the monarch mystery challenge, we might learn more about where they're going, where they are, um, how much time there is between when they're leaving and when different milkweed species are emerging. I think that's all information that we need. Do you have anything to add, Emma? All right, we have a follow-up question about monarch um, or yeah, monarch breeding. And this person's just asking, what about moving larvae from an area where milkweed is depleted to more leafy milkweed? Yeah, this is a this is one we we definitely get this question a lot. And I think, you know, if you're moving um if you're moving caterpillars a really short distance, like within a neighborhood, it's probably very low risk that there's any downside to that. I do get concerned and I, I've heard of situations where people are moving monarchs really long distances and particularly they're in that situation because they're rearing a lot of butterflies. And I think this gets to the heart of that earlier answer that was long winded that I gave, which is if you're not addressing the root causes like habitat availability, you're not really solving the problem by pumping out more butterflies. And if anything, you could be exacerbating it because then there's even less milkweed per monarch. So really trying to think about focusing on the things that we know they need help with, which is um, having good habitat um, and that, you know, pumping out more butterflies, uh, maximizing the number of butterflies we release is not really the part of their migratory journey and their life cycle that we think that they need help at. So that, that piece of it, I, I like to just kind of check of like, why have you run out of milkweed? And if it's because you're rearing, really trying to think about that piece and maybe spending less energy rearing and work energy putting habitat could be a good trade-off. If you're just in a situation where you naturally just have too many caterpillars um, you know, colonizing in your garden, that maybe you know, moving those to your neighbors, that's fine to do. I also you know, think if you're willing to let nature take its, its path, there's um, you know, a lot of these caterpillars, especially as they get larger, can move. So they can move relative distances. You don't need to move them if the, you know, there's a plant 10 feet away, they're gonna find it. Um, but I do think I, I get concerned when I hear people moving butterflies really long distances because of issues like disease, genetics, often because of rearing. 
I've heard crazy stories of people getting on airplanes with caterpillars, going, you know, going to just insane lengths that I think when you zoom out, realize that that's um, probably not really a conservation priority. And I really don't want to see people moving butterflies across state lines, which usually violates um, laws, at least in Oregon and Washington. You can't be moving butterflies across state lines and you can't be bringing in and releasing butterflies that you've bought from a butterfly farm in those two states. And I think it's a good rule for most states that you shouldn't be moving large distances. As soon as you're going to be getting in a car with a butterfly, I think that's a reason to pause and say, why am I getting in a car with a butterfly? These are really strong flyers. These are really mobile animals. So for the most part, they don't need our help. I think sometimes locally, you know, moving them to your neighbor's milkweed patch, if like your milkweed patch is naturally overrun, is totally fine and um, might be a good thing to do. But I think thinking about the scale of which we go and the lengths at which we go to move individual caterpillars might be worth it when I hear some of the more extreme versions of what people do. And I know they're passionate, they love their caterpillars, but I don't know that that's the best, the best thing or the most necessary thing in most cases. Right. The next question, this person's asking about what the best way to support the Monarch Act is, if there's a specific website or petition, or if they should just write to Congress members. Oh, yeah, that's great. I'll put in the chat. Um, we actually have a link so you can autofill like your, your legislators and, and show your support. So that's a great way to act on that. And then um, I think the, the other thing that we really need are kind of cross, um, you know, beyond just the Monarch Act. There's other legislation that could happen at the state level, at local levels. And so kind of finding ways that you can participate beyond the Monarch Act. I kind of gave that as an example, but I think getting policy changes like protections for overwintering sites, if you live on the coast, if you look at your local coastal plan, if that's foreign language to you, it was to me when I started, you can ignore that. But essentially it really um, is, is the, the plan of each community and their organisms at the city level, the county level, or more regionally. And it's kind of a vision for what's protected in the coastal zone and in the coastal areas. And so that can be a great way if you want to take that extra step from a policy side to get engaged and figure out who's running your local coastal plan and make sure the overwintering sites are protected is another really effective way. And it's a little bit of a, um, every case is different. So that's where getting more people engaged and thinking about this and showing up to city council meetings and commenting when people are updating the local coastal plan can be another great way to contribute. Right, shifting gears a little bit, this person is um, lives in an area where there's a bit of competition of interest between protecting over wintering habitat and reducing fire danger. Are people doing work on how to work on both of these at the same time? And is there any research out there? That's such a good question. It's one um, we talk about a lot. I actually was writing a grant proposal yesterday and we were thinking about that piece and if we could do um, some workshops. So I think currently it, it's it's a piece that I know California State Parks is thinking about deeply. I think a lot of other managers are de facto having to, to balance wildfire risk and um, overwintering site protection. Um, and I think they are often compatible. You know, we don't want sites to burn down. We've seen that. There's a site we're working with with state parks in the Los Angeles area called Leo Carrillo. It burned in the Woolsey fire a few years ago. So now that habitat is not useful for monarchs. Those trees are dead for the most part. And so we've been working with a consultant, with the Fish and Wildlife, with state parks, with an RCD, and, and really removing some of those dead trees that were then going to fall and take out the few living trees. So, you know, smart fire management can really um, hopefully be a good thing for everyone involved. But you have to be careful. We've also seen a lot of damage where, you know, landowners, utilities, come in and just cut trees as kind of a proactive preventative measure and don't think about the sensitive resources that they're affecting. And so that's really the concern about making people aware of how important these trees are, engaging somebody who knows overwintering habitat and being thoughtful about how we do that fuels management to make, make those areas more fire safe without you know, removing the habitat that the monarchs need. Lots of good questions this morning. Um, can you address the problem with tropical milkweed? Example, um, maybe it's perhaps okay or not so bad if you cut back in the fall and winter, so then it's emerging in early spring, or is it just always bad due to OE? Um, 
Um, so I feel like it's a sliding scale. I feel like if you are gonna plant milkweed, plant native milkweed. If you have tropical milkweed or love tropical milkweed, I think cutting it back in the fall is the next best thing to do because you're simulating that senescence in the winter. The thing is, I think that you have to have, especially if you're in Southern California or the Bay Area where there's sometimes uh, monarchs there year round, you have to have a heart of stone to cut back your tropical milkweed when there are caterpillars in the area. And a lot of people don't wanna do it and I get it. Um, so it's just, it's hard to do because, <laughs> because there's caterpillars or monarchs in the area, you want to provide them with milkweed and then you end up leaving the milkweed up year round. And so that's, I think that cutting it back is the next best thing, um, but it, it can be hard to do. We do have someone asking about your email addresses. So I just put the Monarch email address and that will go to several different people. You can um, use that email address if you have questions after the, the webinar. Um, I really like this question. Someone's asking how the Monarch monitoring program fits in with Xerxes data gathering and compilation. I think the Monarch milkweed mapper might be what they're referring to. Yeah, yeah, that and the, my guess would also be maybe the mystery challenge and essentially, you know, the mystery challenge um, feeds right into the mapper because um, our partners at Washington State University, Cheryl Schultz and her, her folks, they actually like gather emails from people. So they, they take this extra step if people don't want to use the INAP app or they don't want to go to our website. Um, it kind of lowers the bar of entry. So they can just set a photo and a date and like a location. So it's a little bit less information than we usually require. And then Cheryl and her folks compile all that and give it to us and we upload it to our project. So everything ultimately ends up in our project, no matter which way. We just wanted to have a few different ways um, so that people who maybe are already familiar with, with INAC can also access it. So it's not perfect. We're often delayed because things are manual and it takes time, but we, we do ultimately combine all that data. There's also other projects that collect good Monarch data. Monarch Joint Venture has the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program. If you want all the acronyms and all, all the options, that's a really in-depth one that I like to point people to. Um, if you want to go the extra step, if you've got like a milkweed patch and you want to go out weekly, if you're like a really hardcore person, I think at a bare minimum, they require monthly visits, but essentially it's a way for people to dive in and do more regular monitoring. So if that's more what you what you want to do, there is like a program that I'd say is kind of like the next level in terms of in-depth um, monitoring that's available. Thank you, Emma. This person's asking if there are home um, tests for existing garden soil and plants for systemic incest insecticides. Not that I know of, like we have to send our plant samples off to a lab. We generally advise, like if you know that neonicotinoids have been used in the habitat to wait like two or three years before planting pollinator habitat. Um, but I don't, I don't know of any easy home kits. Um, based on our research, if you're in the Central Valley, you probably have. <laughs> some pesticides in your um, garden. Yeah, I don't know. We, we did another study uh, this last year asking people around the country to send in leaves that they purchased from, from nurseries. So we'll have that out soon as well. You can watch for that um, sort of an aside. And I don't know, maybe Angela, you know more, but I mean, I do feel like extension Offices sometimes are good information for soil testing generally, and I don't, I'm not yeah. familiar with people doing pesticide testing, but you could ask your extension folks, maybe somebody's doing it or knows what companies you could pay to get that done at. Right. Yeah, they might, right. If you wanted to pay to send it off to a lab somewhere, maybe, maybe if you could get a bunch of people together, to make it worth it to send in enough samples. Like, I don't know if you can send in like one sample, but um it might be worth looking into your extension. It's a good idea. Emma. This is an interesting question. What is the best mechanism for creating monarch habitat as the legally binding mitigation? Conservation easements and deed restrictions have proven impractical 
in more urban and suburban areas. I guess I'd want to know if they're thinking about overwintering habitat, which there, there are cases where people are doing mitigation um, for that. I, for milkweed habitat, I'm not aware of anyone requiring that just because milkweed habitat is so, um, you know, monarchs can use such a, a wide range of the landscape. So I'm not sure if that's actually happening in the real world. Um, it's an interesting like hypothetical. I don't know, Angela, if you have other thoughts on that. Yeah, I'm not sure of legally binding habitat. And I don't know how that will, I mean, the rules around it will change once they're listed in 2024. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. So maybe question. maybe we're saying I you know I think there's some fear out there that you know if monarchs are listed that you can't you know do anything that harms milkweed um, because it's a plant that grows in most of the lower 48 states I think we can all say realistically that there's no way that that is how the Fish and Wildlife Service is going to apply the law we are not the Fish and Wildlife Service um, I'm not giving legal advice but I do think it's worth thinking that that's just totally impractical and the Endangered Species Act is strong but it's not that strong so. My guess is that if the Fish and Wildlife Service designate critical habitat, which they don't even have to do, we've seen them not do that with the rusty patch bumblebee, which is another insect listed um, that has a broad range in the upper Midwest and in the Northeast. Um, so if they did designate critical habitat, they would most likely not be designating all milkweed as critical habitat. So my guess is everyone can still do what they want to do in terms of milkweed. Probably be a lot of recommendations of what's better to do, and they might designate things like overwintering sites as critical habitat, where you have legal restrictions on what you can do that would damage the habitat. But I think it's worth. I think there's been a lot of concern that like you couldn't do you know basic routine things, um, and there's just no practical way that that's how that law would be enforced. I think by any any rational person reading the tea leaves that that's just not how it's going to work. So I'm not sure what they're going to do, but I I think there's going to be a practical solution. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, I would also like to mention there are a lot of state departments of transportation and other rights of way that have joined the Monarch concert, the CCAA, the Kennedy Conservation Agreement, um, to, to proactively create and protect monarch habitat along roadways. And so I think there are a lot of voluntary voluntary things like that, that we're going to see becoming more and more common as people, as states and other agencies proactively try to create and manage monarch habitat um, going forward. All right, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, this person is in Southern California and they're current lobby, currently lobbying their city to create a butterfly park. Is there any data that supports these and rather than just one, would creating a pollinator corridor be better? Um, sure, corridor is always better. <laughs> Um, though maybe you would have an easier time starting with one habitat. I'm not sure about data um, or what type of data they're meaning, but I do think that, you know, when you create habitat, pollinators are going to show up. So um, if, if it's data in terms of whether or not it would be valuable for pollinators, I mean, I think, I think we know that it would be. Is that the, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. Um, do you have anything to add, Emma, in terms of data or? No, I, I mean, I do wonder if they're thinking about it from like a monarch perspective, um, which maybe they're not, but there is good research to show that monarchs can use an individual milkweed plant. And I've seen it in Nevada, like really barren hillsides that are pretty heavily grazed, there'll be like one milkweed plant and a caterpillar on it. Um, whether or not that's enough food for a caterpillar to complete its development is maybe a worthwhile thinking about. Like, I think there's an estimate that you need at least three, like relatively large milkweed plants to support um, an egg to a caterpillar. Like that's how much food they would need. 
So planting like at least a small patch of, you know, um, larval host plants is more valuable than, than less, but I don't think you need a very large amount of habitat for monarchs and a lot of other, you know, bees and butterflies are pretty mobile. So something is better than nothing. More is usually better, but you don't, it's not like there's some threshold at which point it's um, not worth it which is really kind of a cool thing about insects. You know, I think I couldn't in my small urban backyard create wolf habitat, right? Um, I can create a lot of coyote and skunk habitat apparently, but I can't create wolf habitat. But I think what's really cool about insects is you could have you know, an apartment with a balcony and you can put out a plant and you, know, you could attract, attract bees and butterflies. So I think that's really powerful and anything, anything can help. All right, one last question. Um, how selective are monarchs in their choice of grove? For example, Pacific Grove had a windstorm ravage the grove several years ago, and it did not seem that monarchs chose another local area, but the monarchs rejected Pacific Grove totally for at least several years. Yeah, so this is a really interesting, um, I think, example of what we know from the science and what we don't know. And so it's why the overwinter sits are so, so special is because if we lose one, we don't necessarily understand the, the, the science and the alchemy that would go into creating a new one. So that's where mitigation is really um, hard often because we don't know all the pieces of why they're selecting what they're selecting. There's great work out of Francis Villablanca's lab at Cal Poly, where he and his students are really thinking about this issue deeply. And I'm working with a PhD student there, Ashley Fisher, who's really diving into this. We think there's probably multiple layers of selection of why monarchs choose the sites that they choose and that they can move from year to year. So it's, it makes it complicated for us humans with like our, our property boundaries um, and our desire to have things be like, okay, this is monarch habitat, this is what we do. But weather varies, the animals vary, the population's been declining, and then you can bounce up. And so we really have to be, I think, conservative. And so protecting habitat, trying to keep it healthy. And what we've seen at Pacific Grove is you can have good habitat, and then you can have a weird windstorm come through. And the monarchs might not leave one year, but maybe they don't use it the next year. And some of that is based on the management of groves, um, but some of it's not. And some of it's based on just what's going on with these really mobile, really dynamic systems. So I think it's worth kind of thinking about a lot of this management from the long run and not like from year to year, because we can't often pinpoint, okay, it's because this one tree fell that they didn't show up. But if over time they're not showing up at a grove or the numbers are really steadily going down disproportionate to what's happening through the rest of the coast, then we might say, okay, that site seems to need some help, um, which is what we've seen at Los Padres, Plaskett Creek. The numbers had gone down disproportionately, even with the decline of population. And we looked back, a lot of trees have been cut a few years ago, and we think that really affected the wind protection. And so we're replanting and hoping that in the future that site can host more butterflies. So I don't know if that's good, but it's these are really complicated issues, and it's not necessarily driven by any one thing, but it's kind of thinking about this over time. And you could have the best habitat and they might not show up. And that's also a hard truth we share with some of our managers as well. 